Good morning, and welcome to our panel on powering the digital economy. Um, this is a really interesting panel because it's not specific. It's about the digital economy, and it's about energy, and um, some very interesting contradictions and gaps in our knowledge. So I've enjoyed uh, trying to prepare for it. Um, when we think about the digital economy and the contribution of technology, the internet, digitization, blockchain, um, many of these elements cut both ways. Uh, digitization and the internet consume a great deal more energy than most of us think about. Um, I've spent a lot of time thinking about energy as an editor at the Wall Street Journal. I've not spent a lot of time thinking about how much energy the internet consumes. We talk a lot about cars, we talk about the extractive industries, not so much about um, the cloud. So today we're going to explore how uh, the digital industries, the ICT sector, I think is one of the buzzwords, uh, consumes, has a, a carbon footprint that's a great deal uh, bigger than what many people understand it to be and actually presents a greater threat to our ability to rein in uh, climate change than I think is, is generally realized. At the same time, however, what's so interesting about this is that many of the same elements and forces that are contributing to climate change potentially also hold the potential to uh, help us come up with better solutions and to particularly devise um, ways of finding efficiencies and limiting carbon change. So we have this great panel today um, to address this uh, double-edged sword. Um, Jennifer Morgan is the executive director of Greenpeace. Philippine de Cercles is the global VP of strate strategic partnerships at Schneider Electron elect uh, Electrics. Forgive me. Um, Antonio Neri is the incoming CEO of HP Enterprises. And Paul Ellis is the CEO of Electron. Um, Jennifer, do you think you could lay out for us, just to get us going, um, a little bit more about the facts and, and so help us to understand what the real carbon footprint of technology is and how it is increasing? Sure, I can get us going. I mean, I think um, when Greenpeace started looking at this uh, and ran our first campaign on it as a campaigning organization back in 2010, I think the thing that struck us was that, you know, this infrastructure on IT and digital is probably the largest kind of collective system that we as human beings are, are building. And the way that that's done uh, will be quite important. So if you look at the energy use, maybe just to highlight two different issues. If you look at the energy use um, and the projections out to 2025 20, on electricity, it could go from 7% up to 25%, which would put it at about fourth if it was a country <laughs> uh, looking out into that time frame. And if that is a, a coal-built, fossil-built infrastructure, it's a, obviously a great risk to countries meeting their Paris commitments and addressing climate change as a whole. Um, but a lot of the emissions also come from the, the supply chain itself, because about 20% of the sector's global energy footprint is tied up in the manufacturing of the devices. But um, actually, for Samsung, Apple, et cetera, a lot of the, uh, of the emissions actually come, 70 to 80 percent of their carbon footprint comes from the supply chain. So I think that's one issue, and there's no, you know, nobody looking out at that mm -hmm. um, as far as regulation or incentives or any of that right now, and we can talk about that later. There's some companies that are stepping forward and taking leadership on that, but that's one piece. The other is obviously the materials. Um, and, you know, cobalt, um, both from a, a human rights perspective and an environmental standards perspective, obviously has many issues around it, so, and geopolitically as well. So those would be the two issues that I would um, outline as, you know, the, the main things that we're looking at at Greenpeace and can talk a little bit later about the response that we're seeing, which is quite positive and negative. I think it's both what you're saying could go in different ways. Oh, that's very helpful. What about in terms of industry? Um, Antonio, can you give us a sense of how widely uh, understood or uh, shared are these concerns in industry in terms of the environmental footprint of both, you make a good point, Jennifer, both the sort of the hardware, yeah. the manufacturing piece, and also the electricity consumption uh, by technology companies? Sure, good morning. 
Uh, great to be here with the panel and with the audience. Uh, I think, first of all, I don't think it's well understood. I think Jennifer just uh, highlighted some of the issues that we have to work as a, as a community of leaders and governments and, and the society as a whole. You know, when we think about, uh, and by the way, that requires a tremendous amount of education that we are responsible for. When we think about some of the, the trends we see today, we speak here at the World Economic Forum about the fourth industrial revolution, blockchain, artificial intelligence, and so forth. What, what we, we see is an opportunity to really dramatically address some of the fundamental problems in the world, create new economic uh, opportunities, but at the same time, what we realize is that all these new technologies demand tremendous amount of power. And um, think about it in your life. Everything around us computes. Everything we do in our life now computes. And that requires tremendous amount of power that we have to think about it, how we develop these technologies for the future with sustainability in mind. The core of this is all about the data we are generating. Today, we generate every day 2.5 uh, quintillion bytes a day. For those who understand quintillion, is after trillion. And um, you know, with that, basically, it's 18 zeros. And what is really astonishing to me is the fact that in two years from now, we're going to double the amount of data that we generate in mankind. So two years from now, we're going to have double the amount of data we have generated in the history of humankind. So to manage all the data, you need a lot of power. And to extract the um, insights and insights interaction, you need a lot of computational power. And the reality is that the current architectures are not sustainable. We are not going to solve the problem today with the current way we um, you know, architect the compute platforms. So we at HPE um, are thinking about this, and we have been thinking about this for a long time. In fact, we made a very strong commitment to reduce the power consumption 30 times by 2025. However, we don't think that's good enough. Um, and uh, that's why we are thinking about how we're going to deal with the, the challenge we have with the, uh, the Morris Law, which is basically the law that was put in place by Jeffrey Moore, which basically says every 18 months or 24 months we can double the amount of compute capacity. However, we need to reduce the power consumption. And we think there is a better way to do so. And the way we think about that is how we create architectures which are data driven. And basically reduce the power <coughs> significantly in that, in, that, in that equation, and then ultimately use alternative uh, energy sources like hydrogen cells and other things to power these massive data centers we have to create going forward. Philippine, if I could ask you to pick up um, on Antonio's comments and give us, if you have a sense of how seriously the industry takes these issues and what kinds of solutions people are coming up with, um, that would be very helpful. Yes. Yeah, I think you've, uh, you've framed the issues uh, very, um, very clearly in the sense that uh, it is true that um, the rising uh, consumption of data centers, for example, uh, in terms of the, the industry, um, is, 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 is significantly um, increasing. Today, it represents about 7% of the total electricity demand. Uh, but what's true, actually, uh, one of the questions being, uh, is it possible to power the digital economy in a sustainable way? Mm -hmm. And it is, it is. It's a question of implementing the huge untapped energy efficient potential that still remains. So on an overall level, uh, estimates say that there are about 75% of cost effective energy efficient untapped potential. And that's true across all sectors. So in the building sector, it's about 80%. In industry, 60%. Cities could be 80% more <laughs> efficient. Um, but if those uh, technologies were being implemented uh, in the IT industry and in data centers specifically, uh, we could uh, reduce even if those numbers that you pointed out, Jennifer, on, on uh, uh, the, the, the increasing levels and, um, and data sentence that will be created, that will need to, to be created to power this digitization of the overall economy, we could uh, only increase, so if they are going to triple by 2022, you could uh, reduce the increase in actual electricity uh, consumption mm -hmm. by only 3%. 
so, so you are totally right in saying that um, it really depends what uh, direction we take. Mm -hmm. But technologies do exist. So a big potential contributor that could, in fact, uh, increase those numbers exponentially is uh, cryptocurrency and uh, Bitcoin and blockchain, right, which the platform that underlies. Paul, can you tell us a little bit about um, <coughs> why it is that uh, Bitcoin, that mining Bitcoin consumes so much energy and that blockchain represents potentially a game changer in terms of the energy consumed and potentially saved? Well, I'll hazard a guess that uh, the consumption uh, of Bitcoin miners and Ethereum miners and so forth is probably the fastest growing um, uh, region within data centers of, mm -hmm. of uh, energy consumption. Um, it's probably worth just uh, exploring why that is uh, and what, how, how does this come about. Essentially, blockchains work um, based on, they have three principles that underlie them. Uh, the first one is um, game theory, economics, and I'll come to that in a second. Uh, and that's the important one for this discussion. The second one is cryptography and the use of cryptography to secure the, uh, the platforms and secure access to the various accounts. Uh, the, the third area is what you call peer-to-peer peer, uh, uh, peer -peer interactions. And, and this was really um, driven by, by companies like BitTorrent, uh, where they were file sharing. So it's a combination of these three technologies that come together to form uh, allow blockchain to work. So the first one I mentioned, uh, game theory or economics. Uh, the way in which blockchains work is they effectively incentivize parties to stay honest. Uh, and in the case of, of um, Bitcoin blockchain, for example, you would need to have what they call a 51% attack in order to undermine the essential transactional integrity. And the way in which that 51% uh, attack I I is secured is through requiring parties who are mining Bitcoin or, or effectively adding blocks to the blockchain to require them to undergo uh, or take part in what is called a, a consensus mechanism driven by proof of work. Uh, so proof of work involves uh, the Bitcoin miners or the Ethereum miners uh, engaging in very computationally intensive uh, calculations. Uh, calculations that can take, in the case of Bitcoin, something like uh, 15 minutes or so. In Ethereum, it's normally about 16 or 17 seconds. But essentially, it's the same principle that underlies it. You have to solve a very computationally challenging problem. It, and in fact, it's being solved with specific hardware. Uh, so the Bitcoin hardware is very specifically designed in order to solve this computational challenge. The Ethereum uh, blockchain uh, uses GPUs. But again, very specifically designed, um, uh, well, very powerful GPUs that are used to solve these problems. So underlying blockchain is this requirement to solve a problem. And by putting in that work to solve the problem, that's what secures the network. So that's essentially what's sitting behind it. Uh, so that hopefully is a, a brief outline. There are mitigating ways of handling this, which I think we'll probably come on to. But for the time being, the main blockchains are all using proof of work. Can we just, before we move on to sort of another round of questions, just stay with that for one second and try to put some numbers on how much energy is required, for example, to mine one Bitcoin? Which is sort of a trick question because I don't know that there's an exact mm -hmm. accepted answer. Well, for the miner itself that gets lucky, so, so it basically it's a random process, which, which miner ends up mining the next Bitcoin is a random process. So, so there are thousands, tens of thousands of these miners um, active all the time trying to be the next one that mines the, the 25 or 12 and a half Bitcoin. Uh, so to say how much energy for that particular miner, very little, relatively speaking, but for the whole system, a lot. And I think some estimates have put it as uh, the entire uh, energy consumption of Ireland uh, is consumed in Bitcoin mining. In fact, very recently, in, uh, just in the last two weeks, I noticed that 
uh, a Bitcoin miner has actually purchased a power station in Russia specifically to do Bitcoin mining. Right. Hmm. It now costs apparently $1,000, back to the hardware question, mm -hmm. just to buy the specialized equipment that you refer to necessary to do the math, basically, um, to produce a Bitcoin. Is that? That sounds about right. Yeah. Hmm. In highly concentrated areas. So, so there'll be huge sheds of effectively tens of thousands of these $1,000 uh, right. devices. OK. So um, in terms of our first round, I think we're hearing some of the dimensions of the challenge, both in terms of the uh, clearly growing demand, if, if Bitcoin is just one visible yeah. uh, headline example of how uh, computing is creating growing, soaring demand on, on electricity systems, and also potentially some sense that there are companies and uh, organizations starting to look at solutions, which I'd like to explore in this uh, second part of our panel. Um, in terms of policy, so we have regulation on tailpipe emissions. Uh, we have lots of regulation or attempts at regulation in different ways, um, subsidies and, and so forth around the planet aimed at, uh, in many cases, reaching the goals of COP21. Is anyone, is there a need to think more or to find ways to more directly tax or address the um, carbon footprint of technology? Mm. Jennifer, is that something you thought about? Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, as far as where we are on this right now, there's, there's 20 global IT brands that have signed up for 100% renewables uh, of their data centers. Um, and including including HP, um, and with uh, really Facebook starting, Apple coming in, Google, and I think one of the main challenges that they find is it, it's geographically very specific, right? So as far as the availability of renewable energy, mm -hmm. um, and one of the key challenges I think that we need to get to, which is kind of a parallel to your question, is if um, we need to have these types of commitments for 100% RE, and it needs to also go into the supply chain as a whole. But then what are the energy systems and the policies on energy that um, companies are trying to, to deal with to actually source renewables? So a number of the companies that have committed to 100% RE are now also engaging um, in states in the United States and countries like Japan to say, we need to be able to source this to try and get a bit more uh, diversity because there's a lot of growth in renewable energy in some places and in others there isn't. Samsung right now, for example, 1% of their electricity comes from renewables. Uh, Greenpeace is trying to see if they can see the light and come our way. So I think one piece is making sure that the energy policy framework that's renewables. I totally agree on the energy efficiency side of things as well. Uh, to reduce that demand, the more we can reduce the demand, um, the better. So that's good news on that side of things. And then I, you know, I think that's the question of the, um, you know, the the regulation or the policies that go across the supply chain as a whole. Um, that could then create the incentives for companies to actually have to source. Um, from from renewable energy as a whole, but right now it's we're not there at all. If I may, um, I think the first half of the panel we've we've uh, we've identified and we've uh, underlined a big challenge and the the quite unnoticed sometimes mm -hmm. challenge that this uh, digitization of the economy is is raising. But I think it's important to underline that it's also really uh, a part of the solution. And what I mean here is that because of the digital, uh, digitization of the economy, it's really transforming the way energy has been generated, uh, distributed, and consumed in unprecedented levels, in unprecedented ways. And the fact that today, uh, digitization and energy converge mean that you add a, a layer of software on connected products, which means that you can choose when, how you consume your energy, you have much more flexibility, and, and you have to understand that this, uh, this uh, leads to um, unprecedented levels of efficiency, and so 
you have to keep that in mind as well in terms of considering the, the big challenge that are being raised. Uh, but I would say that we need to definitely accelerate the implementation of those technologies and mm. policies are needed for that. And you mentioned uh, carbon tax. I think what we need is clear price signals. So that means no subsidies and uh, a pricing of externalities. So uh, in effect, a pricing of carbon. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm glad you made that point, and I think one of the things we're trying to get at here is the idea that this is a double, exactly that, that there are, technology may bring as many solutions as it is creating um, additional demands. Um, let's talk about, let's keep talking about efficiency. Um, Antonio, I don't know if you want to yeah. jump in on that point. Yeah, uh, I will. So I think uh, there is a couple of points uh, I want to make. So first of all, to Jennifer's comments, we need to look at this from both the supply and the demand side. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously the supply side, how we, provide these alternative ways to power these uh, new technologies. Paul explained extremely well the need to drive this computational side of the house, but on the, de on the, uh, on the demand side, we need to drive significant innovation. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, from my standpoint, when we're gonna live in a world, everything is hyper-connected. You know, by 2020, we're gonna have 100 billion devices connected to the network, and the amount of data, again, that we are generating is just unbelievable. What are the demand, the demand innovation aspects we need to go about it? And, and this is where, you know, we are thinking about a whole different approach on the compute architectures of the future. We believe we need to go to a memory-centric compute. And the reason why is because, given a great example of Paul, where basically you need specialized equipment to mine this data. What about if I have the data all in one place and only bring the right computation to that data? to extract the value that they're looking for. When we think about what's happening today, it's basically simple physics. You know, you have a CPU, you have memory, you have storage. Mm. When you calculate something in that system, you're dealing moving electrons back and forth through a set of copper, and that generates heat. Heat needs power to cool it. And so when we're thinking about it, why we leave the data all in one place and don't move the data around, but just bring the right compute capacity to that data to extract inside quickly and at the same time dramatically reduce the power needs of mm -hmm. that architecture. We think in a memory centric compute, you actually need very little power to maintain that data at rest, which means we can dramatically reduce the power consumption by a factor of 100 times. And so this is where I think we, we think about the, the, the supply side, how, how we drive that innovation, in the way we power these massive data centers, but at the same time, on the supply side, how we power these new systems mm. in a whole complete different architecture, which not only makes uh, the power needs go down, but at the same time improves the business performance by a factor of a thousand. And I think that's, uh, that's w why we need to drive this innovation going forward. Regulation is important, but it's an incentive to drive that innovation mm. forward. So that's in terms of how, um, what about in terms of the grid? I mean, if you want to look at this from a grid perspective, where does blockchain come in? Mm -hmm. On the grid? Or on the whole, well, the grid and, and yes, I guess that's okay. a fine way of um, Well, I, I guess that uh, I think the first thought um, that, that I think we, sh we should be discussing is the rewards mechanism that has been established for mining uh, blockchains, uh, for mining uh, the next block in a blockchain. Um, and, and the whole reason why you're seeing this vast, uh, the strains on the grid, the, 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 the vast investment in this is because the rewards um, uh, and the price of Bitcoin and Ether now uh, are so large that it's economically viable for people to do this. So, so I guess the first question is, is, are the rewards set up, or if the rewards were to be changed, which is, by the way, a very non-trivial problem, as certainly in the case of Bitcoin, um, could this dramatically uh, or have a, a significant I impact and an effect? In one sense, the genie is out of the bottle with Bitcoin. You, people have made vast investments in, uh, in specialized mining equipment for this. Uh, the only other use for it really is, is uh, basically uh, hacking people's passwords. So if we actually push down the Bitcoin uh, blockchain network, that's probably what they'll move on to do. Um, I think there is... Um, a great optimism, however, or certainly scope for optimism in this area. Um, 
the Ethereum network in particular uh, doesn't use specialized hardware, it uses GPUs. Um, and there has been a project really since the inception of the Ethereum network to move to proof of stake. And that would remove this huge investment in, in mining equipment uh, and effectively make the consensus, the, this, this game theory that I mentioned that it is underpins the integrity of the network, moves that from being done by effectively expending energy and doing calculations and moves it to being based on the amount of ether that you have at stake. Um, the final, I think, um, re reason for optimism here is that all of the focus, all of the interest is on these public blockchains. Uh, everyone is, is, is looking at that now. But actually, I think all the real use cases, the real value that's going to come out of it, the, 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 the reason for um, uh, being able to improve efficiencies in, in energy industry, in the uh, financial services industry, and so forth, um, can actually be done within consortium blockchains. And consortium blockchains do not require you to create consensus using proof of work. And in fact, normally that would be done using proof of authority. Now, that again would dramatically, would just basically remove all of the, uh, the energy costs associated with it. So um, I think there are two big swings. First of all, Ether in particular, Ethereum, excuse me, uh, moving to proof of stake. And secondly, the fact that we're seeing a bubble right now on public blockchains, but the real value proposition is going to be coming from the consortium and private blockchains, which will not be using proof of work. Isn't there also, um, I was reading that there are some pilot projects, including one by IBM. They've launched a blockchain-based green asset management platform. Um, they're trying this in China. And this could become a way of, this could address some of the concerns that we're talking about. I'm not familiar with that platform, I'm afraid. Um, I. I there are many initiatives around blockchain in, uh, and, and certainly looking at green energy, there are, there are um, blockchain firms out there which are proposing uh, creating incentives to invest in solar power, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's very much a force for good, but we've got some pieces of it wrong. And in particular, the rewards for mining and the focus on proof of work, I think, is the, is the problem here. But uh, these are not insuperable problems, and I don't think we'll in 10 years' time, still be talking about proof of work as a problem. Just one other thing I wanted to just, I think, is the role of government and policy is really also to get, well, we can't get out ahead of this because it's already moving, but to really be looking at um, making sure there's the investments in the transmission side of this mm -hmm. and the whole uh, network that is needed in order to build the infrastructure mm -hmm. to power it and to see that this is going to happen, can happen quite quickly. And um, I think oftentimes because it is invisible, it doesn't make itself up onto the radar screen of what's going on here as far as the, the projections go. So I think that's quite important as well as really looking at the R&D into storage. So it, it gets more into your energy debate, right, as far as how we're going to do this. But I think it, it just puts an additional imperative on all of those discussions, um, as well as higher pricing of CO2, yes, um, and I would say standards on some of the uh, efficiency side of things. So, um, and it's, I think, often a debate that's not joined together. To what extent are companies factoring these concerns into their decisions right now in terms of how to invest, where to invest. I think you talked briefly, well, uh, HP has, has signed on to the right. uh, Greenpeace initiative. Um, there were some other companies that I won't name that um, you cite, for example, as locating their cloud servers in jurisdictions where their power is almost exclusively coal-fired. Yep. So you have this cloud that's basically <coughs> being you know, coal-powered. Yep. Um, are companies making more active decisions to uh, are the policy frameworks such that companies are now being incentivized to make investments <coughs> that take into consideration these kinds of factors? So I will start. I mean, at Hewlett Packard, we have a long history of innovation <coughs> with sustainability in mind. This is the core values of what uh, the original founders, Bill and Dave, uh, put in place, you know, is to innovate, make a contribution, and do it sustainably. So when we look at our roadmap and what we do, 
obviously we think about that mm. and actually we put very aggressive goals in our product roadmaps and that's why last year I came uh, to the industry I said we're going to make a commitment to reduce by 30 times the power consumption mm -hmm. by 2025. Mm -hmm. That said we are not satisfied with that and that's what I explained early on how we radically uh, how we think radically different about the problem we have today and then incentivize our R&D and by the way our HP labs to think about the problem in a different way and that's why whether it's the the supply and the demand side of the house our entire supply chain where we procure these products, all the way to how we architect even the power supplies. These are incentives we actually put in place for our engineering community. Philippine, did you have some comment on the industry and it's how, it, how companies are handling this? Yeah, I was um, going to add that uh, actually, as uh, Antonio had pointed out uh, earlier, in terms of sourcing out of uh, renewable energy, uh, what we're seeing uh, in our um, energy advisory uh, services is mm -hmm. that actually uh, the IT players are some of the biggest now uh, PPA investors in, mm -hmm. in from renewables. They're mm -hmm. invested uh, as much as three gigawatts. So they are being conscious mm -hmm. and are being active on that side. I don't think there are enough incentives, but uh, they are still making some conscious and voluntary uh, mm -hmm. uh, move into that direction. It, just to, uh, as a resource, we do a scorecard for those of you who want to dig in deeper. <coughs> Click Clean, we're doing a new one this year. We're also looking at 24-7 renewable energy uh, supply, so it's not an offset regime anymore, which gets into a bit of the details on the accounting. But we think that you really do need to be looking regionally so that mm -hmm. if we're looking for as Greenpeace for where we are sourcing our uh, electricity, we want to be able to know 24-7 that it's from renewable power. But you'll see that, you know, you've got... Um, a Google and a Facebook and an Apple all up at the A. Hewlett Packard's about in the bit below that at this point in time, so we could sit down and talk about, because I hear your commitment to that. But the, the real laggards right now, unfortunately, are in Asia. Um, and so that's where I think we are doing quite a bit of work because mm -hmm. you do see uptake in renewables in some places, and South Korea has made a big commitment to move away from coal and uh, increase renewables. But um, that's where a lot of the growth is, and that's where we need to be mm -hmm. to be looking. So, but not only in Asia. <coughs> I mean, I noticed there were some interesting outliers in the U.S. on your list that I yes. might not have expected to find yep. on that F score. On the F score, card. they're mostly um, yeah, but they are. It depends on the different part of it. But IBM is not in a great place either. Um, so yeah, you can see we have a whole methodology. We just want to make it transparent, also because I think our supporters are really obviously online all the time and if they're Greenpeace activists and millennials are coming up I think you're going to see more and more <coughs> of this coming our Are way. shareholders asking for this? I mean is this some is this an issue that investors are taking into consideration? Is this something you hear about from shareholders? Not so much from shareholders per se but I will say there is a, is a board discussion for mm. sure, you know, like cybersecurity is, mm. what we're doing to improve, uh, you know, our contribution to reduce the carbon emissions and so forth. We go through a whole process in that conversation, particularly as we, we think about the, the products and the services we are bringing to the market. What about Philippine and Europe? Do you have a sense that this is something that shareholders, investors care about? It's a board level conversation? <coughs> I think it's, uh, as Antonio was pointing out, it's a question of uh, all the stakeholders we engage with, among which increasingly, yeah, shareholders and investors, and we're seeing, uh, we're seeing a movement in the financial community growing uh, interest in uh, sustainability issues as well. I think at this point we can open up the floor to some questions. Um, I've got one over here. Hi, thank you very much for this very interesting discussion. I'd like to ask Miss, uh, Mrs. Morgan about geo the geopolitics of cobalt. You mentioned it, and if you could elaborate a little bit, that'd be great. Yeah, just briefly, it's not, it's not my expertise, but um, I think on some of these sources, more on the, on the parts, obviously, than on the electricity side, but you're seeing that there are countries that, that have the main supply. Um, and so I think how, um, where we go as far as whether it be um, storage technology, battery technology, and how they're built, 
we need to be looking at where those sources, you know, how they're actually being sourced, where they're being sourced from, what are the environmental and human rights standards um, that are there, because optimally we should be having the highest standards applied everywhere. And this is a separate but very linked topic. We, we also have <coughs> released a report this week that actually shows there's many corporations that will be in one place, but they will be outsourcing or have subsidiaries somewhere else, and they will not, and they'll use the standards of the place where they're operating, not where they're headquartered. Um, and there's lots of violations, whole nother set of case studies that are there. So that's more what I was um, referring to. Do you have any other questions? They're giving the mic so that they can. Yeah, I'm Arun Sharma. I'm a board member in the Adani Group and Deputy Vice Chancellor at uh, Queensland University of Technology. Um, if you look at outsourcing, it actually had the model of follow the, the sun. People right. used to work and then pass off the work to everyone. Are people looking at enterprise, distributed enterprise models of data centers where the, the data centers basically are in different locations and they follow the sun. Mm -hmm. And then they basically, when their turn comes, you just basically uh, realign the, the data. Yeah, I mean, uh, listen, the, the fact that you are in a mission critical 24 by seven, right? By default, you have to keep the support going on uh, as the other people come online. Um, I think there is way more work to be done to follow these principles. Um, you know, and again, I think Jennifer talked about this is a regional problem, but ultimately how we apply the same principles as we follow the sun to make sure that data center have the same principle of energy efficiency and sustainability and process. I don't think we are there, to be honest with you. Right. Well, you get that, uh, but the issue is that I think if you go through the policy and application of that, I don't think we are there as an industry. I'm not speaking for us because... Uh, we are one unique case, but as an industry, I don't think the mentality is, okay, I'm gonna have this level of energy consumption here, how I bring it to, for example, in India, which obviously is a very large hub, and India has its challenges with power distribution. So we have to make sure, as we grow our business globally, that we bring that conscious aspect on, on sustainability by you know using models like that. But I think right now we are not there. At least that's my point of view. Did you want to jump in with something? You no. Did you have another? <coughs> Hi, Daniel Shen, Young Global Leader. A fascinating topic. Um, as you remember, at CES, you know, a few weeks ago in Las Vegas, there was huge pouring rain, and then it literally stopped the venue for an entire day. So, you know, we've been talking about empowering this economy, but then those are natural catastrophic events. Are we resistant or are we ready for that? Can you touch base upon that? I, I Well, I can just comment from a, um, there is some work that's been done, which is um, the link between <coughs> climate-related extreme weather events and the impact on supply chains, mm. uh, which I think is incredibly important for business leaders to look at. Uh, there was some work done a few years ago by um, Paul Polson and uh, Michael Bloomberg on this, and particularly in the well, and and there was work by the Department of Energy on the electricity sector, and what that can mean actually not just for this sector but across the board, and I think it's a, another one of those um, connecting the dots things that um, people may not be connecting these various issues or extreme weather events that are coming and what it's going to be doing for the for the supply chain. So it's just a general comment of something that if I were a CEO, I would be taking very seriously right now. There are, in fact, I believe, credit rating agencies that now take into account um, exposure of supply chains to potential weather and climate events. Mm -hmm which shows that it's a serious material. It was one of the top risks identified for this meeting. Yeah. Did anyone else want to jump in on that point, or should we move on? I, I mean, I, I think it's um, absolutely a big topic. So when we, in our, in our yearly and, you know, and quarterly reviews about enterprise risk management, this comes up all mm -hmm. the time, is uh, about how we maintain uh, resiliency in our supply chain, how we do sustainably, 
And then ultimately, listen, last year in the United States was a disaster. Yeah. I mean, hurricanes and um, tropical storms. Think about what's happened in Florida, Puerto Rico, and in, in Texas. And that had the major disruption. So the question is, okay, how we distribute the supply chain and, and, and ultimately how we deal with that energy requirement because, you know, we can't take the energy and not support the people that have any needs. Hmm. Think about even Puerto Rico today. Only 70% of the island is the that got the power back. 30% of the people still don't have power, right? So it's a, it's a much bigger topic than, than supply chain, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. uh, and also has implication on jobs as well. Uh, so... We, we can talk about this, but ultimately moving things around has social implications as well. Mm. But in the enterprise risk management that we discuss, we obviously talk about this all the time, and one of the contingency plans and how you establish those uh, resiliency plans that you talked before. Mm. So, yeah, I think in terms of uh, building resiliency is, is of course very important, but <coughs> actually cutting the emissions is what we're facing. We're facing two major issues at an overall level, which is in terms of the energy sector, which is of course cutting emissions and providing access to energy to the 1.2 billion people who still don't have access to reliable and and uh, and, and and safe uh, power. And I think in those two challenges that we are facing, again, uh, to 2030. 50% of the solution comes from implementing energy efficiency technologies that exist right now and that just need to be accelerated, implemented. And what we need is to rewire the way we behave, the way we think <coughs> about uh, energy systems, and just implement those solutions. Absolutely. Thank <coughs> Thanks. Um, I have. Um, a statement and then also a question as well. Um, uh, we're uh, the founders of BW.com, so we're 1.3% of the global Bitcoin mining network. We're also the third largest mining equipment manufacturer and um, I could agree with you that proof of work is not here to stay, even though we're in the business of manufacturing the equipment that supplies this ecosystem. And um, that's because we started before proof of work, uh, well, proof of stake and other proof of importance mechanism existed, right? Um, and uh, it's, it's a distribution mechanism to um, allow everybody to gain access to uh, the first bitcoins. If, if a proof of work didn't exist and we just went straight to proof of stake, then Satoshi Nakamoto will own all the bitcoins ever existed. Um, so uh, as, as an outcome, uh, the sw uh, switch over to proof of work to proof of stake is inevitable not just for Ethereum, but for all other proof-of-work cryptocurrencies. Um, so that will reduce the power consumptions there. Um, also, uh, um, my question more is um, towards uh, the distributed um, file sharing uh, platforms that can be built using blockchain technology that might mm -hmm. uh, reimagine the entire data center business model. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that is already being discussed and, of course, experimented in the uh, blockchain ecosystem. And, you know, we're talking about creating a, uh, a new token economy that might power um, a competing force towards data centers. So um, do, you, do you guys see that being um, a threat on the horizon of disruption? And how do you guys insulate yourself from that? Thank you. Good question. Paul, is that something? Sure. I, well, I can certainly address part of that. So. I think um, distributed file systems, um, a, as you're, you're no doubt very well aware, um, very often include duplication of data. So actually the storage uh, requirements for distributed file systems could actually increase. Uh, that said, of course, the uh, traditional uh, database always needs resilience and needs backup and so forth. Um, I, th I think what potentially I, th I think might be interesting to see is whether or not we're used to an electricity system, an energy system, in which the cost of energy effectively for many consumers is smeared um, across all the, the generation sources. Uh, renewable um, has really virtually a zero marginal cost. Uh, if we were, for example, in the case of um, data centers and Bitcoin mining and, and those kind of uh, power consu consumption, if that were to be 
more um, structured according to the actual price, the, the real-time price of electricity, uh, you might be able to start producing the incentives to adjust the, the data consumption or the, the, um, the amount of uh, computations that are needed in the data side and incentivize it to be moved, as this gentleman said, to follow the sun. So it's, I think there's quite an interesting dynamic there, and I don't, I don't think this is played out yet, but, but I think that uh, Bitcoin could actually be something that pushes us to adopt something like this a little bit faster. Other industries uh, will adopt the blockchain technology, not only cryptocurrency. The, they're talking about a lot of more industries adopting the blockchain. Can you name some? Well, energy for a start. For sure. um, energy, the energy industry. So there's a vast shared infrastructure there um, which relies on um, asset repositories, uh, asset registration information uh, which uh, could benefit from blockchain. Uh, a very interesting area right now in energy is demand-side response, and, and that's something that's very um, germane to what we're talking about here. Um, and, and that could also benefit from blockchain technology. So that's in the energy industry, which is my particular field. Um, certainly financial services, as you're probably well aware, that's really the leading uh, proponent in that. Um, supply chains and logistics, uh, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, uh, the list does go on. Anywhere, really, where you have a shared infrastructure in which there are central counterparties who are either operating inefficiently because they're taking too much money out of the system uh, or they don't create a level playing field. Anything, um, which means a lot of industries, anything like that will benefit. Um, the focus here has been on on basically data centers and, and the compute power needed for proof of work in Bitcoin and other public cryptocurrencies. Uh, if you look at the fourth industrial revolution, um, the, the whole gamut of technologies around additive manufacturing, 3D printing, uh, making powders close to the resources country, resources countries will benefit out of it because Manufacturers are the ultimate middlemen, and they will disappear in a 3D printing world. So resource, the countries that produce resources will actually see value, but they need to have the power to convert the resources into powders and ship it. And then the 3D printers, where every household is now producing little things that they need uh, using a 3D printer, the, the power consumption might actually be significantly more than the the economies of scale that you had in mass manufacturing. Is this being looked at? Mm. Because, uh, but yes, right now, data centers and, and Bitcoin mining is the thing, but the coming revolution in manufacturing uh, is likely to be very power intensive because we are getting into extreme customization, but with that, the, the, the power needs might be highly distributed and, 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 and a lot. I'm not sure it's been looked at. I mean, I'm a very pragma pragmatic uh, person on this. I, I think 3D printing is a long ways to go. And I think you will see the application of 3D printing in the traditional way we build things. Um, in fact, my our parent or our sister company uh, is investing quite a bit on 3D printing. In fact, uh, what they're doing right now is how, for example, even produce their own products with the 3D printing, whether it's a shell on a laptop. I, I think... Um, and the 3D printers by themselves. By themselves, right. So I'm using my 3D printing, and instead of having a tooling to build a shell of a laptop, I print my own shell, right? And so that has other implications in terms of, again, the supply chain and, and the power needed for that. I think it goes back to the fundamental principle is supply, demand, and how we balance this ecosystem to make sure that as we think this disruption in this digital economy, we understand the power implications. And I think it's a thought in the making here uh, because I don't think everybody has all the answers. Uh, but at least that's my point of view at this point in time. This technology will have a profound uh, impl you know, change in, our, in the way we live and work, but I don't think we know exactly all the implications down the road. But definitely we should think about it. Are there any more questions? 
I'm going to ask the panelists whether any of you have concluding thoughts that you'd like to share. Takeaways. Mm -hmm. What this leaves you thinking. Yes, please, Jennifer. Well, I mean, I just think we're at we're at such a a, a moment of a crossroads here, and. Um, you know, this I I think we told we are um, at Greenpeace looking very much also to digital solutions to the climate crisis to other issues as well. But if we don't get in now, <laughs> um, from what I'm hearing of what also could be coming, um, then you know we this this won't be a full on win. So I think it it for me it just reinforces that, but also. Um, just making sure, we've only talked about one part of the fourth industrial revolution, but hmm. um, how this is done and making sure that we're all paying attention to that detail. Um, the other thing that I just, um, you know, energy efficiency is like the most underrated thing. <laughs> and I've been in the climate world for a long time, but I think more and more as this takes off, if we don't get our arms around that and actually get quite practical on how it's gonna get done, uh, then this, you know, that'll come back and slam back at this at this issue as well. If I might add to that, um, I totally agree with the image that we are definitely at a crossroad where uh, what we decide right now in terms of uh, the, the the infrastructure we build in data centers and and all all the issues we mentioned, if we don't take the the, the right approach, uh, we're going to hit a wall basically. So. And, but I do think, uh, I mean, having been in the energy efficiency world for 15 years, I can tell you it's the most unsexy thing. It, it has been for a long time and underrated, but at least um, <coughs> actually now it's, it's, it is because of that conversion of the digital technologies which with uh, existing uh, products, the, the fact is that it's actually becoming exciting and easier to use and even customer uh, friendly. <laughs> so I think it's really time that we, uh, that we rise up and that we uh, actually uh, put in place and implement those technologies to make sure that we are set on the right path to that two degree scenario. Yeah, no, I think, listen, I think we hit the wall. <laughs> Let's be clear. Uh, you know, the, 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 the level of change and disruption we see has never seen before. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I think it's exciting. It's exciting because we have an, an incredible opportunity to change the way we work and we, we, the way we live. Mm. However, we need to tackle these big problems and we need to tackle it totally different. We have some incredible technologies available to us, but also should think about the implications to the world and to the society, and, uh, and we have to be responsible. So. I think, at least from my standpoint, as uh, as the incoming CEO of Hewlett Packard Enterprise, we're going to live those values. That's how we created the Silicon Valley to make a contribution and do it sustainably, and yet continue to change the way we live and work. Uh, and I think I'd just add that I think I, I accept the fact that uh, uh, blockchain is is the bad boy at the moment, um, but I, I think there's uh, a great great amount of optimism that that's going to be changed. I'm very pleased to hear. Uh, somebody who is a Bitcoin miner stand up and accept the inevitability of proof of stake. And I just hope he puts his mining equipment to good use afterwards. <laughs> Thank you all so much. This has been fascinating. And I hope we'll have the chance to discuss some of these issues again, see what happens after the crossroads. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.